And this is how you deal with the numbers behind the, the uh, point where, where we were talking about where the acceleration was equal to negative 9.8 meters per second squared and the acceleration is equal to zero. It is called numerical analysis. Sometimes called the Euler method, the EU, the Euler method. Um, and basically it has to do with how do you do, for example, projectile motion and include the air resistance. We're only going to deal with, we're going to walk through one problem uh, and we're just going to deal with the y direction. But before I finish, I will say I do have example problems. It's not a, I don't have any homework problems having to do with numerical analysis, but I did include some solutions to numerical analysis problems if you are interested. And I've also posted uh, the Excel spreadsheet that has the solutions, not just the answers, but also the solutions and how I did all those problems. So this is just one example, only talking about the y direction. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a baseball. A baseball, and these are real numbers, has a mass of 145 grams, has a radius of 3.7 centimeters, and it has a drag coefficient of 0 0.284. Again, you can look up all sorts of stuff about baseballs and that, those are real numbers. We are going to throw the ball upward at 50.0 meters per second. Just so you know, this is 112 miles an hour. That's very fast, but it's a good round number for us to work with. So, how do you deal with this? So, let's look at what happens. We know it's going to go up, then it's going to go down. On its way up, the three body diagram on the baseball, J is going to look like what? Um, it's going to be, it's going to have the resistance force going downwards and the force of gravity going downwards. And when it's on its way down, J, what's it going to look like? Uh, resistance is going up and the force of gravity going down. The free body diagram actually changes depending on whether the object is moving up or down because of the direction of the velocity changes, therefore the resistance force changes directions. So if on the way up we sum the forces, we get the net force in the y direction equals the negative resistance force minus the force of gravity, that's an equal, equal to the mass times the acceleration in the y direction. On the way down, however, the net force in the y direction equals the resistance force, which is positive, minus the force of gravity, which equals mass times the acceleration in the y direction. So what you have to do is you have to say, OK, it may not be uniformly accelerated motion, but we can approximate. We can say, OK, we'll break it down into one hundredth of a second increments. And for one one hundredth of a second, that acceleration is pretty close to uniform. right? So we could say it's close enough, and here's how it works. First off, today's desktop picture is a picture of Ryan. We did some face painting this summer. This is uh, both of my children got to pick their face paint. This is what Ryan picked. I'll just show you Janice. This is Janice. <laughs> it's a good description of their different personalities. Um, yeah, we'll just say that. Okay, so. Here we go. Uh, let's do. Nope, I want to do this one. All right. So, here we go. We have our initial time, we're going to say is zero. Our initial position, we're going to say is zero. Initial velocity is 50. We have some information about the baseball here. We have the mass, the radius, the drag coefficient. We have the density of the air, 1.29 kilograms per meters cubed. The cross-sectional area, remind me, class, what's the shape going to be? Circle. Therefore, the area is? Pi R squared. So this is equal to pi times the radius oops, uh, equals pi times, times the radius quantity squared. So we have the cross-sectional area. Now, the force of gravity. 
We just figured it out. The force of gravity is equal to mass times the acceleration due to gravity. So it's equal to the mass, which is this one, times the acceleration due to gravity, times 9.8. Now, we do need to make sure that this doesn't change. Because if I were to just take this and drag it down, you can see that this changes to J3 to be an absolute reference. In order to do that, I put dollar signs. And that makes it so that each time, it will simply refer to that single cell each time. You can see it refers to the mass. Okay, drag force. Now, the force of gravity was negative, so we do need to include that. The force of gravity is negative. The drag force is also negative. It's negative 0.5 times the drag coefficient, which is this number over here, but again, it needs to be an absolute reference, times the density of the air, again, an absolute reference, times the cross-sectional area, absolute reference, times the velocity squared. So this cell, quantity squared. And that's not an absolute reference because that's going to change from trial to trial. The net force is just the addition of these two. The force of gravity plus the drag force. The acceleration is just the net force divided by the mass, right? Net force equals mass times acceleration. So the acceleration is going to be equal to the net force divided by the mass of the object. And again, the mass of the object needs to be an absolute reference. OK. So we have our initial conditions. We are now going to say we're going to go up by 1 one hundredth of a second. So our position. How are we going to figure out our position after 1 one hundredth of a second, assuming UAM for this 1 one hundredth of a second? assuming it's UAM, we have an equation for UAM. So this is equal to the initial position plus the initial velocity multiplied by the change in time. So uh, one time minus the other time uh, plus 0.5 times the acceleration times the change in time, uh, which was A4 minus A three, that change in time quantity squared. After one one hundredth of a second, we are half a meter above where we start. How are we going to figure out the velocity after one one hundredth of a second? Carolyn? Time in this particular case, which assumes time initial equals zero. So, Velocity final equals the velocity initial plus the acceleration times the change in time. Okay, and all of these we can simply drag down. And we have, you can see, we've gone up a half a meter. Our velocity has decreased slightly. The force of gravity should stay the same. The drag force decreases a little bit because the velocity has gone down. Therefore, the net force is going to decrease a little bit. Therefore, the acceleration is going to decrease a little bit, which is going to change our final velocity for the next one. So now, we can harness the power of the cell. Okay, so let's see. Let's see what we've got here. All right, so let's zoom in on this so we can see. So, you can see the velocity is decreasing as the position goes up, right? Velocity is decreasing as the position goes up. Velocity is decreasing. 
you can see here the acceleration is decreasing as well, so is the force of drag. Now, this is an important point. Why? What's happened right here? Okay. Um, it started to go down. We're at the very top, we're at that point where it's going to start going down. Why is it important? Why do I need to identify this point? Because at that point, the direction of the force of drag So at this point, I need to change the direction of my force of drag. This is the force of drag. Right now, it's very, very close to zero, but it is no longer negative. It is now positive, right? So it's at this point, and if you'll see, that this is the very top. Oops. You can see this is the very top, and we need to change direction at the very top. So rather than having a negative, we have a positive. And so now we need to, so we have a positive resistance force which is going to change everything. So now we have to click and drag. And you can see right here, we reach the bottom. Because, well, we'll go one more. Looks like we need to go. You can see right here, our position is 0 0.185. And here we've gotten below where we started. Okay. And our acceleration here is only negative 4.117. Now, Let's take a look at the baseball. Uh, let's do, actually, let's start with this one. This is the position as a function of time for the flight of the baseball. Started out at zero seconds, ends just past eight seconds. But the thing you need to realize here is because the direction of the resistance force changes, the halfway point is actually pretty far in front of four seconds. It takes longer to come down than it does to go up to that halfway point. Okay. The velocity as a function of time looks like this. You could see it starts out at 50. What would the final velocity be if we had no air resistance? 50, 50 yeah. down, negative 50. Yeah. So, but it doesn't end there, it only ends at like 30, negative 33 or so. Right? So there's a big difference between the two. So we can actually look at and compare this with ideal data. For example, this is the position as a function of time if you have air drag. This is the position as a function of time if you don't. It's actually in the, in the air more than two seconds longer if you don't account for air resistance. The velocity is a function of time. Hold up. Why is the velocity as a function of time, why does, as an ideal case, why does it have a straight line? Same. Because the acceleration is constant. And the slope of a velocity versus time graph is acceleration. And your acceleration is negative 9.8. So this slope here, you can see, is negative 9.8. And you can see the original has a, or with a drag has a very different slope. And lastly, the acceleration as a function of time, well, it should just be a horizontal line at negative 9.8 for the ideal case. But it's very, very different with the non-ideal case. Again, not a part of this class. Interesting, I get people ask me this, the questions about this all the time, so here's your answer. And if you want to look into it further, you can do ones where you have both the x and y direction where the direction of the resistance force changes, which means you need to include both the x and y direction so you don't have a constant velocity in the x direction. It's very complicated but fun. Uh, and you can look through those online if you want. Any questions on this before we move back to stuff that actually is a part of the curriculum? And again, you can see why this is not. You can't really test this on the AP test, right? You can't do that. But I do want to return to this part, being able to figure out like terminal velocity, what happens, the, the limits of it are is a part of the curriculum and is important for this class. Karen. Right, but if you look at this, it's the maximum. It's like the area that is presented by the object. Because that's not actually the area that hits the air, right? 
Well, that's, but that is the area that is perpendicular to the velocity. So that's, by definition, the, in the equation. It's, it includes all of that piece. And so the part that you're talking about where, you know, the shape of the object, that's controlled by the drag coefficient itself. So it's a combination of the two. 